Good afternoon and welcome to AB Live, a brand new news based chat show in which we discuss topics ranging from business, news, politics, and so much more. On today's episode, we are discussing the UAE's healthcare sector, and in the studios, we have Mohi Al Rafi from GE Healthcare, we have Dr. Ramadan Al Balushi from DHCC, and we have Fadl Ben Turkia from Okadok. Thank you so much for joining us, guys. It's a pleasure. Pleasure. Right, so Dr. Ramadan, I'm just going to start with you. Can you tell us more about what DHCC is and what it does? Sure. Uh, DTC stands for Dubai Healthcare City, and uh, we are an authority in Dubai. Basically, uh, we are the uh, dedicated free zone for the healthcare in the region, uh, and by size, we are the biggest uh, healthcare uh, city in the world, dedicated as as a land. We do have range of uh, activities. The main activity is licensing all healthcare facilities and professionals across the region and in, in our uh, in Dubai and in, in our zone. Plus, we do also license the non active the non medical activities, uh, in a sense, to to boost our business and to help us to 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 uh, uh, reserve our uh, economy. Okay, interesting. So now, Fadil, just coming to you, Okadok, we're aware that it is a startup and a healthcare startup. So, what exactly is the role that it plays in the market today? So, Okadok basically it helps patients to find and um, search and find uh, practitioners um, across the UAE. Uh, they can read about um, their practitioners and they can do instant appointment, cancel and reschedule. Mm -hmm. And it helps also clinics, hospital and doctor to get more visibility and reduce their emotion. All right, very interesting. So uh, we also have Mohi from GE Healthcare. So uh, Mohi, you do provide a lot of services to the hospitals and the healthcare centers we do, that yeah. we've just spoken about right now. So can you tell us more about the, the exact kind of services and the devices that you provide? So GE Healthcare is a large multinational, one of the largest and leading uh, medical imaging and diagnostics companies in the world. So we're in the field of imaging diagnostics, your big capital equipment in hospitals, CTs, MRIs, cath labs, as well as in the critical care space, we provide incubators for babies, we do anesthesia devices, ventilators, and so on. So we're really partnering with both the public and private sector in bringing innovative technology, but not just technology, more than that, solutions that really help transform healthcare and deliver better outcomes for patients. Right, so what are the kind of solutions you're talking about right now? Because I need to understand the problems that are there and the solutions to which you are providing. So look, healthcare is under a huge global transformation. I mean, there are three key things I think that are the big trends coming forward that we're working and partnering with both public and private sector. The first, and I think the biggest opportunity, is around data management. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look at a hospital today, they generate something like 50 petabytes of data annually. The problem is a lot of that data is fragmented, it's sitting in different departments, it's not interconnected, but more importantly, they're not able to extract actionable insights that deliver better care for their patients when it matters most. Right. And so, as a company, we partner with them bringing technology solutions, AI, machine learning embedded into our devices to help solve for that, to help allow them to structure the data, analyze the data, but more importantly, turn it into actionable insights that they can deliver better care for patients when it matters. All right, so that is one of the key trends yeah. that you mentioned, yeah. but uh, we've seen a lot of discussion happening about, around stem cell, and we're so happy when DHCC had announced that there is a laboratory in Dubai itself where stem cell uh, services are essentially going to be provided. Can you tell us more about that? Well, stem cells is now the future for healthcare, I think. It's not only for a specific disease or a specific condition. And uh, Healthcare City, we always try to uh, encourage any innovative uh, healthcare uh, practitioners or practitioners to work in, in the region. And one of the most uh, important areas which is now evolving so quickly is stem cells. And we probably, yes, we do have. Uh, those, uh, the, the center basically divides between storage and treatment and curing and so on. So it's, it's a big one. Uh, we are serving as currently for the whole Emirates of Dubai. In fact, they're even doing it for outside Dubai. And they do have dealings outside Dubai as well, outside UAE, uh, such as other countries. Our role comes in to uh, encourage them how to uh, uh, introduce such a service. Mm -hmm. And of course, the most uh, uh, key was to how to encourage them from a regulative point of view to protect the patients and the, uh, themselves as well. Right, so is there awareness of that in the region right now, would you say? Uh, it is happening now a lot, actually. The whole country is doing even the, uh, there is a new regulation which is coming soon uh, for the whole United Arab Emirates to talk about stem cells regulations and how to be treated even inside, outside, how to be deported, how to be transferred and how to be even collected. Even uh, to talk about the companies which they can collect and how they uh, even to market such a, such a service. Um, uh, this is a, a, 
and care about the whole government, not only initiative from the work of the city. But the, the, the good thing is that we are really proud that we are the first one to start such a business in the region and even to encourage such a thing as I mentioned. Right, considering the benefits of stem cell, I think it's a very, very important thing to start in the region as well. But now coming to you, Fadil, uh, out of the three of you, uh, you're all present here, you're probably the one who's got the most number of connections with the patients directly. So because you all deal with the patients, you do get a lot of feedback from them, etc. So my question to you is what exactly are the, the growing demands from the patients that you have right now and what do they need from this healthcare market in the region? Yeah, so I think what we um, are seeing and what we're solving or trying to solve is one is the discovery part and then the finding part. So what we see is that patients are looking for doctors and practitioners across different criteria. So it could be spoken language, which is very important. You want to meet uh, a doctor uh, that speaks your uh, home language, that understands your uh, healthcare background back at home. And uh, so that's very important. And you said you have 85 languages? More than 85 languages wow. on, on our search. Um, and they also want to find a doctor that is within their insurance network. They want to find by location. Uh, they want to find by availabilities. So we're kind of solving that kind of a, of a problem, and we see that there's a lot of uh, uh, searches happening through these criteria. And then the booking, basically, right? They kept up the, um, uh, offering like an instant booking for the patient, right? So uh, a lot of clinics have, are limited with their working hours. Um, some of them have call centers, things like that. Right. Um, having an instant booking today, we are used to book everything uh, online. Everything is 24-7. So we're trying to uh, provide the instant booking to the patients as well when it comes to the healthcare, which is the most important. Okay, so you're basically the bridge between patients and the hospitals and the healthcare providers yes. here. Great, so now I have this question because you mentioned insurance and I can't stop myself from asking this and this is open for all of you. Um, mandatory insurance was uh, obviously introduced in the UAE yes. but it also came with a lot of drawbacks and a lot of problems. For example, uh, the insured has to pay between 5 to 20% of the fee. Uh, sometimes the insurance companies have different schemes which isn't really favorable for the people. So what would you say are the main challenges of this entire uh, scheme that was introduced, the mandatory health insurance, and what do you think needs to be done to improve it and streamline it? I'm going to start with you, Dr. Ramadan. Okay. <laughs> Uh, well, actually, I think I will link it to a few other points. Now, in the United Arab Emirates, uh, we are, I think, one of the luckiest countries that we have a Ministry of Happiness. Now, we are seeking today, we are not only seeking the, having the best doctors and instruments, which we do have now, but we need to look after our patients. The patient, after all, is a customer. So we have to have this perspective more than a patient. He is not coming to see a doctor. He is coming to be satisfied with the service. So part of this is health insurance. If we go back to the history in old days, there was no insurance at all at the country. And the, many of the residents or visitors coming here, they're complaining that the, the treatment which they're getting is linked to the payment system itself. And we cannot get any treatment unless we have to go back uh, or to our countries. Yet the government was still supporting them by giving free treatments and from the casualty and so on. Mm -hmm. By introducing the health insurance, it really rectified a lot of errors in the system that it uh, made the, the atmosphere of UAE really attractive for the visitor, for the resident, for the investor to live in, in the country. Now, once you apply a new system to the country, it's always normal to have drawbacks and problems, which we always try to rectify quickly. So the payment system, the acceptance of the insurance, even the acceptance of such diseases, machinery and so on, it will take some time to be revised. And we do have this continuous revision. So regulation of the insurance itself is not an easy uh, thing that we can just take it from outside the, of the country and adopt and adapt. We need to change. We need to see what is the need of the culture of UAE. We do have 9 million expats living in UAE. So we need to look after those. Plus we have 1 million and 1 million plus of UAE nationals who are also living in, in UAE and from different cities. So by having such a different system mechanism of how to embrace this or changes, I think it's a really acceptable, in my opinion, it's acceptable to have those problems, but the only thing we have to always look after is that we need to change the system, we need to rectify, which is happening continuously. All right, would you agree with that? Is there a... No, no <clears throat> fully agree with Dr. Ramadan. I mean, healthcare is a basic right for everyone first and foremost yeah. and to live in a country that offers that provision and to ensure the population allows better access to care 
So I think you know the government is very forward thinking in terms of the initiatives and programs it delivers for its citizens as well as for the expatriates that live here. Um, and at the end of the day, it's about how you capitalize on that insurance scheme to really build specialization of care so that the people that need care can go to the right centers to meet the right qualified doctors and get the right treatment when they require it. And I think that's what we're seeing. We're seeing an ecosystem being established that allows better access, but access to the right care with the right specialization in the UAE. It's a very interesting point you mentioned there. So Fondula, I'm going to come to you again because you have access to the healthcare centers, doctors, etc. Uh, just one question, do you think at this point in time we do have the, the necessary number of doctors to treat the right kinds of diseases and especially all kinds of prevalent diseases in the UAE? Do we have enough doctors? I mean, if we look at the, at the data, um, the UAE is, um, is, is definitely, when you look at the number of practitioners per uh, 1,000 inhabitants, um, the UAE is definitely um, quite close to the highest countries in the world, like some average Europe, for example. Okay. Um, I think the, the average in Europe is around 3.7 uh, doctors for 1,000 inhabitants. I think the UAE is close to this number. Okay. Uh, <coughs> then it will be different by Emirates, it will be different by specialities, yes. uh, but I, I would say that uh, the UAE provides a very good um, uh, number of uh, available doctors across specialities, across spoken languages, and definitely the fact that the country is so diverse, mm -hmm. it requires as well a lot of different languages uh, available for, for certain patients. Right, so you've answered the first part of it. Sorry, well, I was just going to say, what well, I was going to yeah. say, it's important, you know, you focus on the doctors, but I think we need to broaden that scale. It's the whole care team, mm -hmm. the nursing staff and all the care team that's important. And one of the things that we um, do quite proactively in the region here is help partner with the public and private sector yes. to drive education. Because it's not just about having doctors or nurses, it's about having capable, competent doctors and nurses in place. And so investing in their education long term, mm -hmm. elevating their skills, helps them to optimize the technology solutions, but also deliver better care um, for the patients as well. So it's really looking at how you cover that whole spectrum, not just the doctor doctor ratio, but the whole care team right. capabilities in the country. Uh, right. so I, would, I would like to add uh, one thing more, I think. The, the government also did uh, establish the capacity plan. And this is very, very crucial and important, not only for the investor part, it's also for the residents of UAE. Mm -hmm. Why? Because, as you mentioned, the, it's not today about having uh, general doctors. You need to have specialty yeah. doctors. Yeah. But once you have studies saying that what is needed for the coming 20 years, this also builds another capacity to the investor, what's happening in Dubai or UAE. At the same time, the patient's expectation is to have a specialist access rather than a GP doctor then given an appointment to see a specialist. Some countries, by the way, they adopt this system that you cannot see a specialist unless you see a GP doctor. Mm. Okay. I think in our system in UAE, it's, we are a bit lucky that we don't need to go to a GP system and then to a specialist. So the access for the patients to see a specialist is available even faster than some other countries, mm -hmm. which makes it easy for them to, to get the right doctor at the right place. Mm -hmm. And of course, with the, such systems like Okadok and which provides a platform for the patients to access them quickly, makes it even easier for them. Right, so which brings me to the upcoming projects that you have in DHCC. Uh, we know you are essentially a conglomerate of so many different healthcare facilities and centers. But do we have more of these projects coming up where you're providing niche or super specialized services for the patients? We do actually. What we do in, in healthcare city, we don't compete with what's happening around in the same region. We have uh, uh, Dubai, the whole region. We have Abu Dhabi, the capital, and they have the five other cities in UAE. What we do, we complement those. So what we see the need is there, and we, we try to encourage the investors to uh, establish more facilities in those fields. For example, uh, the last uh, three or four weeks back, we were working with one of the, our hospitals in, in the region, which is Medical Clinic Group, and we established uh, the first and the biggest wing of oncology, which is now proudly treating all the patients across UAE and out outside UAE. Mm -hmm. It was a challenge actually because again, if you go with the system, there is an insurance uh, acceptability for those cases. There is how to attract uh, specialized doctors from outside to work in, in UAE mm -hmm. for such disparity. How to convince the patients to get the treatment for cancer cases to be treated in UAE rather than traveling. Mm -hmm. So it was a big struggle for all of them. But as a role for DHCC, what we did, we try to help them as much as we can that we boosted this one. We went with them, we talked to the government officials, we went to the patients and so on. And today we have a successful story of having the biggest thing proudly in, 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 in Dubai, mm -hmm. which is providing such a thing. Yet, we also work in, in more than this one is the technology itself. 
Yeah. The government is encouraging us a lot about AI, artificial intelligence, blockchain, and so on. And we are lucky in, in, in Dubai that we uh, leadership is always supporting such initiative, which will cut the journey of the patient, at the same time provides the optimal treatment in, in a fast pace. All right, great. So I am going to get to AI in a bit, but right now uh, we do know that cancer is one of the biggest killers in the region uh, or actually globally. But what would you say is the biggest killer right now in Dubai or in the UAE? Um, I mean, to me, I don't have this data, but I would say not finding a doctor that is available and where you need, you seek help and you seek uh, healthcare, uh, for me, is a problem, right? <coughs> we um, were talking just earlier about the availabilities and do we have enough doctors in the UAE. You may have a lot of doctors with availabilities, but these availabilities are not known by the patients or doctors are not known. So technology can really help providing the availabilities of all the specialists uh, to the patient and I think being able to have an appointment in less than a minute or in less than 30 seconds yeah. and, uh, and being to see somebody very quickly helps a patient feeling already better knowing that he got an appointment in the next few hours. All right, so... Uh, sorry, and to your yeah. point around, you know, the disease states, cardiology, um, you know, is a big issue in the region. Um, oncology is a big issue. Obesity, diabetes, especially type 2 in terms of lifestyle changes yes. and so on. So those are the big challenges across the region, not just in the UAE and also globally. Um, one, of the, one of the opportunities is not so much focusing on just the treatment component of who's sick today, but focusing on the wellness and health of those who are healthy today. So how do you unlock that population health education and awareness to prevent the disease, which is really where the burden of cost facing the government today, both the public and private sector is coming. So how do we work you know, in partnerships to really to bring disease management under control at a very early stage, making people more empowered to take their own proactive health, mm -hmm. control that? Um, how do you release that data to be more personalized to the individual versus kept in the treatment section in hospitals? Yeah. And so I think that opportunity of unlocking population health will try to reduce some of that burden. But today, definitely cardiology, oncology, and diabetes tend to be the big three um, that we need to manage. Right. I, I would just add one more point. I think the public health is really doing a great job currently in the country in uh, making the patients aware of yeah. such diseases. Now, the, uh, I'm not, I will not mention a specific government because all of them are doing the same yeah. thing is that we, they are aware of the patient there is today something called uh, lung cancer for, the, for men. There is something called breast cancer for ladies. What to do next? So by creating such an awareness, the patients are really now aware of having periodic uh, tests and checkups to make sure that they are uh, not having such a thing. Even from um, uh, older age patients who doesn't, don't read and write, but still they're watching TVs and so on, listening to the radios. They're talking to different, uh, they're reaching them to their own language as well. We do have the residents who speak um, different languages than Arabic. So uh, the country is doing a great uh, campaigns around these things and, and periodically uh, through the whole year, which is really uh, interesting that it's gonna reduce uh, remarkably those such uh, events. Right now we've mentioned that there is awareness, which is a good thing. Education is happening and it's coming from the government, which makes it even better. But another thing is uh, the role of regulatory authorities. Uh, you work in the regulation sphere of DHCC. So what role do, would they play in all of this? I would say earlier today that the regulations in my, in my, feed, in my thinking is different. The, there is something called over-regulation and under-regulation. What we work in healthcare city is innovative regulation, which means that the whole uh, system now in medicine is not that before as uh, in early 60s and 50s. It's just changing daily basis. So what we do in, in, in healthcare city, we do study such trends. We do change according to the needs of the patients and the specialties available. Currently, the whole, we have uh, the whole world. Is, the medicine is being applied everywhere. And the complementary medicine is coming, invading, and people are believing it more and more. And in fact, it's causing more treatment and better maybe outcomes. So we can't close our eyes and ears and say, listen, we're going to follow the traditional medicine and forget the rest, which was, is not true. We need to make the blends between them. And of course, always what we put in my, our mind is that this should be in the benefit of the patient and working with the quality and patient safety. So we are developing such standards and uh, we're trying to, to, to work more and more. Now, uh, last year or a year ago, uh, the government, for example, tied up with China to provide such treatments in the region. And Chinese medicine is one of the really famous uh, uh, medicine given to the patients. Why not to explore more, 
why not to see how we can bro bring and attract such an activity? Right. If we have Western European countries, which they have College of Medicine being more than 500 years uh, been teaching there, why not to encourage those professionals to come to the country with the different measures? So this will make the mix and blend of these uh, professionals and activities, mm -hmm. this will make the elevate the medicine and uh, give the better treatment for the and patients. And it will also be great for medical tourism, which is what we will get at yes. shortly. But before that, I know we've discussed technology widely, we've discussed AI briefly, uh, but we also have done a survey about the 3D printing units in the country that will help the healthcare system. So here is a short video that is going to help you explain all about the 3D printing units in the UAE. That video was about how 3D printing can help the UAE's healthcare sector and how some of the projects have already begun. So we were talking about regulation etc before. So just coming back to your point about that. Now uh, one thing that has been taking the, the country by storm and just started very very uh, in, in small scale I would say is uh, definitely medical zoning. I would like to know your views on that. Medical zoning is another way or another tool to attract uh, uh, business, first of all. Secondly, to, to, to attract also or encourage specialization in areas. For example, uh, once I mentioned that you do capacity plan, if you think that for the next coming 20 years you need five oncology uh, um, hospitals or not clinics, you need to plan it from now which areas you're going to cover, what specialties, are you going to do the treatment? Are you going to do the radiotherapy, chemotherapy? So medical zoning basically talks about all of these issues and ideas and even the anchor state, where are you going to put it? You are a United Arab Emirates, so you have many cities around. Where is the most best location for these uh, centers to be located? Uh, when, we have, when we have to say stop accepting applications of oncology, mm -hmm. when we have to say change the regulations to attract more business in dermatology. So medical zoning is, is, a, is a wide uh, terminology. Yeah. Uh, been lots of studies around it today. And uh, again, UAE is always trying to make those innovative techniques and ideas to attract. So uh, we are currently doing to such, such uh, studies and uh, what to see how, what's going to benefit UAE or Dubai specifically. But maybe such apps thing. like uh, Okado could probably help because uh, you deal a lot with geographies <coughs> and you do have access to the different hospitals in different areas. So do you think you could eventually end up playing a role in medical zoning or the whole process that is taking place? Definitely, I mean, we are seeing um, a clear um, demand-based data, right? So directly from the patient and the... Uh, as Dr. Ramadan just mentioned, it depends on the location, it depend, but it will also depend on the insurance, yes. right? So you could have uh, a certain specialty and centers available in, air, in one area, but 
maybe the coverage in terms of insurance won't be enough or in terms of language spoken, uh, etc. So definitely we get a lot of data and, uh, and that could definitely help. All right. Yeah. Great. So I think Fadal, I asked you about what the patients really want from the region, what they are looking at. Uh, Mohi, I need to ask you, what is it that the hospitals are really looking for and what is it that they are demanding? So there's a, there's a definite paradigm shift in terms of how healthcare is being transformed at a hospital and provider level. In the past, it was all about buying technology, providing technology. Today, it's all driven around efficiency and productivity. You know, they're really looking at outcomes. You know, how do we deliver better outcomes, whether those are clinical outcomes for patients, whether they're financial outcomes, whether they're um, operational outcomes. And so, as a company, we're partnering very closely with hospitals today, trying to tackle some of those more forward-thinking problems. It's about how do I drive capacity? How do I make sure the patient experience as they go through the treatment is optimal? How do I make sure my assets that I acquire today are assets that will last me a long time and I utilize them to its full capacity? How do I partner with the right operators to drive efficiency in the departments and in the hospital as a whole? Unlocking wastage so that can be reinvested back into better patient care. Yeah. Um, and ultimately, how do I deliver better outcomes for the community I serve? And so as a company, we work through our healthcare partners team to really sit down at the table in partnership with public and private hospitals and governments to really look at how we can support facilitating those kind of you know, outcome-driven, forward-thinking um, solutions that are in need today that will ultimately serve all of us as patients as we go through the system. So you're obviously coming from a business background there yeah. then. So talking about the healthcare business in the region, how lucrative would you say it is, considering we've seen the market actually getting saturated with so many healthcare units and services in the country? So. so Look, I think the demographics of the region, we have a relatively young population, so the demand on healthcare is going to grow over time. So I think the steps we're taking in partnership um, with the government, with the public and private sector to really think about how we prepare for that is important. Um, uh, the disease states we spoke to earlier are relevant and are big. We need to kind of curb those through, as Dr. Ramalan said, better education and awareness so that we reduce that burden in the long term and allow people to live longer and healthier lives. Um, I think the economics in terms of investment, you know, there is a need, as we spoke earlier, for more doctors, more nurses, but more skilled people come in, but definitely more specialization versus generalization. And from an infrastructure build perspective, definitely as the population grows, you're going to need bigger hospitals, potentially more specialized hospitals versus more generalist hospitals. So these are a lot of the dynamics. But what's encouraging is that we work and live in a country in the UAE where the government is very much about investing for the future, investing early, and bringing in solutions and technologies that will help leapfrog them from where they are today to where they need to be in the future and be really ready to serve the demands of the population that's going to grow. Sure. But I think, sorry, I think one thing is also happening now in healthcare is the technology itself. Yeah. We used to have only... In old days, we used to have only simple systems, just like a uh, system which will make the whole process faster. But today, we're talking about a total evolution about AI and blockchain and so on. Um, I would ask myself, Mahi, how we think this is happening now. I think with AI and blockchain and many other applications, uh, mm -hmm. there is a, also a, a, a positive and negative feed, uh, things about it. For example, is the manpower going to be less? Yeah. Are we going to have robots more? Uh, and are we going to have uh, lots of, of uh, systems which will definitely say, I don't want my, any more cashiers, for example, to, to pay. Mm. It's going to be uh, automated. automated and you don't need to have those people. So how do you, how do you so see I this? Think, on I think you, you touched on a very critical point. AI, machine learning, all this trend and speak that we see is definitely coming through in healthcare as it has done in many other industries. Um, in healthcare specifically, to your point, this myth of will the robot replace the doctor, I don't think that's going to happen, personal view. I think what will happen is doctors that don't use AI will be replaced by doctors that do use AI. Okay. And that's a trend I think that's going to happen over time. Mm -hmm. Where AI will really add value um, is from, from our perspective, when we embed those applications into, into our devices, it will help to deliver faster diagnosis which is really important in healthcare, to prioritize, for example, an imaging scan, every, an x-ray, everyone's done x-rays, yeah? 
Um, in an x-ray scenario, if you take an x-ray of a patient at a point of care, and that patient is diagnosed through the AI, through the machine learning, to have a pneumothorax, a collapsed lung, that x-ray can be prioritized to the top of the list and sent straight to the critical care team to take intervention early. That's one example. There's many more in stroke management to make sure that stroke um, people who have stroke are identified early. Mm -hmm. And what AI does is it allows for faster diagnosis. In the future, it can potentially provide a preferential diagnosis to support critical decision making. And at the same time, um, what it will also do is it will leave a lot of the mundane administrative tasks that the caregivers today are doing, yeah. free them up of that, automate that to yes. perspective, mm -hmm. to really allow them to do what their job should really be, which is about caring for the patient. So it drives efficiency, it drives better care for the patient at the time and the point of care. Mm -hmm. and, it, and AI can scale the expertise of the world through machine learning. You're not just relying on one doctor's experience, you're mapping your personal data to millions of data points globally. Yeah. So you can get a potentially a predictive analytic view so of your health, you, you not can, just a current view of your health. You can doctor yourself. I don't know if you get to doctor <laughs> yourself, but I think it's an interesting point to raise because in the future, I mean, we all sit here today as the uninformed healthy. We're only healthy because we don't show symptoms. In the f coming near future, once our data becomes live and empowered to us through wearables, through connected health, mm -hmm. connected to a virtual coach or yes. connected to a specialist, we move from being the uninformed healthy to the informed health. Yes. And what yeah. that does is it unlocks our ability to take care of ourselves. Yeah. So do we doctor ourselves? In a way, yes. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking forward to that future. I think that's an exciting future yeah. for all of us. Yeah, so the point is uh, doctors are still going to have their job. 100%. Yeah. Well, yeah. The job's job going to change, but they're going to have their gonna job. Change, yeah. All right, great. So just on those lines, what you mentioned here, that you know, you still need the human hands, but then technology is going to just make it easy, brings me to the telehealth facilities that you have introduced. Isn't that an example of what he just explained right now? Actually, it is one of the live examples and it's been expanding dramatically and really fast. It's not a new technology by the way, it's been used since many long time, but the culture has been changed now is accepting this technology to be uh, practiced among us. Uh, the telemedicine we started initiating in two of uh, our major hospitals in, in DCC, uh, Sleiman Habib and uh, MediClinic, is basically it enables the doctors to speak to other doctors of the same network, for example if they have a group of hospitals. It also enables them to speak to their own patients. So a patient has a file today and he can't um, see a doctor in a fast uh, appointment or something. So with the telehealth, he or she can just immediately plug into the system, see the doctor using live appointment system, for example. He can see the doctor, consult, and so on. Not all the disease they need to be seen by the doctor physically and examined. Yeah. If he's a chronic case, for example, a diabetic case, or he's maybe a, a psychology case or something, they don't need to see a doctor all the time. Right. But if the doctor has this patient file, with the telemedicine actually, it will shorten the time, it will make the efficiency more, even it will increase the customer happiness again. The customer satisfaction is very crucial today to, to make sure that the patient is getting optimum treatment in a fast pace. And the telemedicine is helping a lot actually. Uh, we don't know even how it's gonna evolve eventually. Today we're just talking about patient doctor and doctor to doctor. Mm -hmm. Maybe in the future time it's gonna be system to system. And maybe it's going to be while you're driving, you're going to talk to the doctor himself yeah. and, and so on. So it, it is evolving very fast. Technology is helping us uh, a lot to, uh, to uh, provide patient access and, and, and really fast. And I think live appointment system will eventually go again to a telehealth uh, appointment even and, and, and maybe introducing the telehealth in the same system itself. Yeah, it's transcending geography Absolutely. right now, which is a great thing, I think. Sorry, I was just going to say, you know, the other thing, talking about capacity, you asked, do we have enough doctors in the past? In the, in the region, specialists, one great thing telehealth does is in the interim, as you build that capacity, because you need to train doctors, you need to build that capacity from a human yeah. capital perspective. Telehealth can bridge that very nicely by reaching out to expertise wherever it may be yeah. and bringing that expertise locally yes. when you need it. So I think that component in the short term is very valuable in terms of how you import expertise as you build it um, organically in the country. Right, so do people trust it right now, considering it's again a new system for this region, not globally? So are people comfortable talking to a screen? It's culture change. It's not going to be easy overnight to change it. Some people will uh, immediately accept it because they've been practicing this one either here or outside the country. Some of them will be skeptical and think well, this is good or bad. Some of them they will say, I don't want, I want still prefer to see the patient doctor mm -hmm. physically and he examined me. Yeah. So I think by time, running time, 
technology is coming. Right. Innovation is coming. As mentioned, the doctors today who are working without AI, tomorrow they will be forced working with AI. Mm -hmm. So it's not about accepting or not accepting, it's about culture change, mm -hmm. which I believe entirely that over time it will happen. Once they see the results is more satisfying, I'm sure that everybody will, will use it. Right, exactly. So now, uh, Dr. Ramadan, before the break, you did mention some very interesting points about uh, how Chinese medicines are very popular, people prefer going to other countries, etc. This sort of brings me back to the angle of medical tourism. We've seen a lot of people from the GCC countries specifically go to countries like India, Thailand, etc. because A, medical services are slightly cheaper and B, there are more options available. So do you also sort of predict that happening here where people are coming from other countries and other parts of the world to Dubai and the UAE? Let's start with you, Fadl. Yeah, definitely. I mean, um there are a lot of specialities and, um, uh, available in the UAE that are not available in other regional countries, but you also have, um, we are seeing some trends where a lot of people from, for example, Africa, uh, that can't have uh, you know, visas to Europe, but can meet European doctors in Dubai, so they will speak the language in multiple languages, so they can search by languages, they can book without being here, they don't need to call, it can be done 24 7. So, definitely, I think it's, I mean, we're seeing this trend happening, it's growing, and I think um, uh, even though we, you talk about Thailand and other countries the, uh, that are growing in terms of medical tourism, um, I think the, the UAE is really well positioned and offer a very unique uh, offering or let's say availability of different services by languages, uh, and the technology will help. Mm -hmm. uh, connect these doctors through the instant booking but also through the telemedicine mm -hmm. because once a medical tourist comes to the UAE uh, and let's say he would booked on a, on a platform like Okadok or like the DHCC uh, instant booking system uh, he may need some follow-ups mm -hmm. so once he goes back to his country he can use telemedicine for follow-ups and, and make sure that everything uh, is fine so definitely this is something uh, where uh, we're seeing growing and we think it's really growing even more. Fair, would you agree considering technology is an element here? No, hundred percent, but I think technology is one component. I think first of all people, it's about access. Do I have access to care? So I go where I have easy access to care. I think the infrastructure here in the UAE is allowed that easy access, how people can actually come in and access that care from around the world. So that's one that's very attractive. Secondly, do I have the specialization? Do I have the capability of the doctor to treat me? So that's another part, as they build that capability and that specialization and more and more expertise comes to the UAE, that becomes an attractive offer relative to the region. And thirdly, technology and innovation. What technology is available here to treat me? I can tell you there's a high-end technology innovation investment happening in the country here. And that's really, um, I think that's a really positive thing, not only for the citizens of the UAE, but also for the regional countries that want to have easy access to it. Mm -hmm. So if I can get easy access to the country, and if I know that the system has the right specialization, it has the right technology, what's left outside of that is the experience. And I think the UAE is really working with a focus on happiness and the patient experience as a whole to make that whole journey as they come for treatment, not only for the individual, but the accompanying family, especially in our region and our culture, to come in and have a positive experience as they go through the care system here. Right. Another thing I wanted to quickly touch upon is, uh, again, Moe, do you think with the advent of technology and with the involvement of technology in most of our uh, medical facilities here, uh, medical errors could reduce? Do you think that is a possibility? So, I think one of the things, you know, looking at the advent of AI and how AI is coming in and so on, that's another component of a possible opportunity that comes as an outcome of this, is how do you reduce medical errors? Mm -hmm. um, in terms of not only the medical errors itself, but how do you, how do you identify potential problems earlier? Mm -hmm. So if you see symptoms that maybe on their own don't necessarily are a red flag for intervention, AI in the back end can actually put those symptoms together through, through pattern recognition and scaling through machine learning and all the different data points it has access to, and actually flag earlier to the doctor that, hey, this patient in this ward is potentially having a condition of X, a sepsis in the ICU or so on. That gives a window of opportunity for healthcare providers to come in and prevent possible issues occurring and save lives. Right. But definitely from an error and a diagnosis perspective, as it becomes more rigid and more thorough, it definitely help augment decision making and potentially reduce errors. 
Right, so alright, finally I'm just going to ask you uh, this about the major rules and regulations that have been introduced in the market which makes uh, it easier for uh, startups like you, for example with 100% foreign ownership, uh, we've seen the 10 year visa rules coming out etc. So considering DHCC is essentially a free zone for uh, uh, well, As a free zone what we did, there are few initiatives, uh, talking back about medical tourism for example, we are not targeting uh, specific things like can some countries they target the price, some of them they target the quality, some of them they target a nation. For example, I my neighbor country is Saudi Arabia. I will target only Saudi Arabia. This system has been been done in different countries. What we are lucky today that we do have a mix of blend of these. We target the quality, so we target the best doctor quality here. We do have price, we do have insurance, so the people they can now have a selection of. Do you want a cheaper service? Do you want a quality doctor? Do you want the uh, uh, same uh, 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 way of doctor of, of culture and so on? Uh, and other things, uh, uh, what we did uh, in, in, uh, in attracting the business is that we do have a one-stop shop, which means if I open a clinic today, um, I need to go to at least seven or eight governmental bodies and so on to open that clinic. What we created in DHCC is that you don't need to go to those. We are your... Uh, operator. Mm -hmm. So you will apply once, you'll get your medical license, you'll get your commercial license, you'll get your visa, you'll get your national ID, you'll do your medical checkup, all of them in one place. Mm -hmm. At the same time that it will cut the short time, we also provide you what you mentioned is the 100% ownership and so on. So these, uh, for investor for them, is always handier and better for them to have a one place that can solve all these headaches and problems, yeah. rather than him or herself going to individual places and trying to, to have these. So by targeting a, a, a true one-stop shop, it will make the life for them easier and it also enables them to have a wider selection of, of varieties. If I do have a hospital and I want to open a coffee shop in the hospital, so do I need to go another body to open it or not? Mm -hmm. If I am the same body who is having different setups with a different, of course, uh, it's all according to the government regulations, by the way. Mm -hmm. The only thing we are doing it is that we are trying to ease the process, mm -hmm. make it one place. He can today open a hospital and coffee shop within the same area, with the same government, the same entity, apply and get it uh, right away, uh, faster, and uh, also with a package. Right. And people are all about the convenience right now, yes. which is what we've realized with all the e-commerce and e-service facilities. But thank you so much, guys, for joining us. We've definitely learned a lot about the UAE's healthcare sector. And thank you for watching AB Live. We will be back again next Tuesday.